I think that we have to actually look at some of the foundations and some of the context in which this refugee crisis is actually happening. I gave as a title of my presentation the refugee crisis as a project by design. So I was basically, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explore uh, the sort of legal, structural, and political conditions by which this crisis is happening, who is benefit benefiting from it, and what are the roots of it. And of course, in the law, roots are always very, very far back. So there is some need to look at a longer period of time, because otherwise if we select and we believe that this is a crisis of now and here, we just are in the good path not to solve it. Now, a little bit of context. Today the world has a, an ecological impact of 1.4. Uh, 1.4 ecological impact means that we would need uh, more than a, almost a half another world in order to have the processes of reproduction of nature to happen, okay? The ecological impact of humankind should be one. It's 1.4. Um, there are countries in the world, and we are talking from one of them, whose ecological impact is six. So today, if everybody in the world was living on the non-negotiable standards of living of advanced Western capitalism, we would need six planets in order to survive as a species. The reason why the ecological impact is only 1.4, which is already bad, but it's only 1.4, is because there is the imbalance between the global south and the global north. So trying to deploy a narrative of development by which the global south one day will and should become, as we are in the north, is just a cynical lie. That is not possible, is not serving the interest of anybody, is simply politically something that will not happen, okay? So we are in a crisis of imbalance, a crisis of imbalance that we can see from every possible perspective. The, the truth of the matter is that the rich people in the north don't want to have the poor people in the south come up here, except if they come up here as the so-called reservation army of capitalist production. In other words, there need to be a selection of some people that are coming up here, and they are coming up here in order to fill a role, which is a very, very classic and long-term role that was deployed in capitalism by unemployment, that is to keep the wages down, okay? So this is, this is a point that I want you guys to keep in mind because it's, it's very important. And we kind of reached this point for a very clear project that was the project so-called of modernity, around which the very fundamental legal institutions of the current governments are based, and that exude from the International Declaration of Human Rights. Because I do believe that one good thing that we have to do when we discuss things like the, the, the 71st anniversary of, of a document is to say it's a great document, but we have to be not fetishistic about documents. The International Declaration of Human Rights is based on two fundamental pa paradigms. One is the concentration of power within governments and state. Article 13 talks very clearly about a right of movement within the borders of the state. So the fundamental assumption is there are states with borders and borders are closed. Second point on which is Article 17 of the, of the International Declaration of Human Rights and that says basically is the right of private property. So we have private property and state sovereignty, which are the two pillars of modernity, whose fundamental purpose was the transformation of use value into exchange value. In other words, it was the transforming the commons, resources belonging to everybody, into capital. Those in a, an historical moment in which there was a need for that, Clearly, you know, in the 17th century, 18th century, there was a fundamental need to accumulate some capital in order to obtain some development. And the legal system, the lawyers, the political scientists served that purpose, gave a direction to be able to transfer all, to transform all these commons into capital, and we did that. But now we are in conditions that are completely different. Now we have an excessive amount of capital concentrated in the hands of very few. We have unleashed 
the fundamental working of capitalist extraction, and we protect this as a fundamental right of property, not just of individuals, but of corporations. And in doing that, we are setting down all the conditions for this catastrophe gonna, for this catastrophe gonna happen. Um, one thing that is to be considered very clearly, for example, in front of the, uh, of the Syrian crisis, the Syrian crisis and the way in which the conservative government of Germany handled the, 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 the Syrian crisis is perfectly coherent with the need to introduce in Germany a workforce of educated, highly educated people. Syria was one of the countries in the Middle East, Iraq and Syria, under Ba'ath Party government in the 50s and in the 60s that developed the most advanced system of welfare in a country in the south of the world. And we destroyed that. We destroyed that in Iraq, we destroyed that in Syria, and we destroyed that by deploying the narrative of human rights. This is something we have to take into consideration very clearly because when the session is called what we should do, one good thing is also what we should not do. Okay? Which, because sometimes doing things is worse than doing nothing especially in conditions of very precarious equilibrium, such as the one that are in those areas of the world. Now, the beginning of the crisis of Damascus was the consequence of the pattern that I described at the beginning of this talk. It was the consequence of global warming, was the consequence of water shortage, was produced by almost a million people migrating from the countryside of, of Syria into the city, producing some issues difficult issues for the local government to deal with, okay? So that was the beginning that ignited the crisis. Later on, what was important to do for the Western governments was to profit of those highly educated individuals that are arriving in the country and that will draw down the prices and the cost of, cog of cognitive manpower into the European market sphere today. This is what explains the strategy of the German government of Merkel to actually deploy some narrative of openness, which was a good way in order to select the reservation army. There is a lot of money that are made around the tragedy of the refugees by design because of the law. Because many, many times the law is part of the problem much more than part of the solution. In this particular case, we've been discussing cynically and when I say cynically, I'm saying that we've been discussing, pretending not to see that it was going to happen. A legal distinction that between refugees and mere economic migrants, which is immoral and has as the only, the only consequence of that distinction is to make big corporations profit from the machinery of assistance. And not only big corporations, but also a number of NGOs. Because those people that are detained in concentration camps in Greece, in Italy, in all, thank you, in all, the, in all these places, these people are there to be selected, whether they are entitled to free movement, whether they're entitled to personhood, or whether they are not, okay? And that distinction is producing a huge opportunity for business, for those that actually supply stuff for those camps, for transfers of money from governments to corporations, from the whole kind of activities that uh, predatory capitalism is doing around us today. So what I would recommend here, because we are in a, is to avoid, please, the do-gooding kind of feeling, the feeling that because we are empowered in the global north, we have money, we have to do something necessarily. Let's try to begin to think about not doing stuff that are producing all of it, including protecting out of constitutional law the right of our producers of guns and arms that are trading heavily in those contexts, including exploring the possibility, which I think is way delayed, to a global simultaneous reconsideration of how, of if and how capital and people can be subjected to different regimes. Because we can well liberalize capital, but then we have to liberalize people. We can, or we can,
keep capital local, and then we can pretend to keep people local. But we cannot have people kept furiously local by these barriers, which are the current borders, patrolled, again, many times for profit in a certain particular way, and at the same time have the capital free to go around. Because the freedom of the capital going around is at the very root of the crisis of the refugee. And so we have to consider to realign these two points. Freedom of movement of capital, you like that? Fine. Then there should be abolition of frontiers, period. That is the only thing that might serve some equilibrium. You don't want to abolish the frontiers because you are Trumpite, you're scared of people, you want the, you want the, the walls, then you localize capital. But if you keep capital free and people stuck, this is the result is going to happen. There is going to be an, in, an inhuman selection who is right to go in and who is out that is going to produce many, many disasters. So I think because the time is short, I should stop here. Let me just say, see whether I forgot something that I consider relevant to add. No, I pretty much told what I had to do. Thank you very much.